We go where we're needed, fighting not for country, not for government, but for ourselves. The one who survives will inherit the title of boss. And the one who inherits the title of boss will face an existence of endless battle. You risked your life to save our motherland! Now it's our turn to defend your country! You've given us a real reason to fight, big boss! I cheated death thanks to you. And thanks to you, I've left my mark. You have to. You've written your own history. You're your own man. I'm Big Boss. And you are too. Hello everybody, my name is The Voice Box, and today, I'm introducing the fascinating tale of a leader who walked the fine line between greatness and tyranny. Big Boss. In a world where power is both a blessing and a curse, Big Boss emerged as a figure of an unparalleled influence some hailed him as a visionary, a mastermind who steered his people towards prosperity. Others whispered in fear of his iron grip, labeling him a dictator. In this video, we delve into the complexities of Big Boss's reign, exploring the highs of his leadership and the lows of his authoritarian rule. From grand achievements that transformed nations to controversial decisions that shook the very foundation of society, Big Boss's legacy is multifaceted as the man himself. So join us on a journey for this history as we uncover the enigma of Big Boss, a leader whose story transcends the boundaries of heroism and villainy, reminding us that the line between greatness and tyranny is often blurred. Throughout the Metal Gear series, Big Boss challenges the established order of the world, which is often dominated by governments and superpowers. He questions the morality and the motivations behind these power structures and seeks to create his own independent vision, free from external influence and the powers that be. Unlike conventional heroes or villains, Big Boss embodies a complex morality. He's neither purely good nor purely evil, but rather a product of his circumstances. His actions are driven by a desire for survival, revenge, and ultimately, his vision of a world where soldiers are truly free. During the Cold War, the competition between the superpowers extended beyond military capabilities and into various spheres, including technology and space exploration. The space race, a noticeable facet of the Cold War, exemplified this rivalry as both nations sought to demonstrate their scientific and technological prowess. By reaching milestones such as launching satellites, sending probes to other celestial bodies, and ultimately landing humans on the moon, where nations amongst the world were trying to achieve their own world order. The very backdrop in which Metal Gear Solid 3 is set serves into something that Big Boss would be a part of, and in fact, it would be the driving narrative to expand exactly why he himself resented being a part of the geopolitical environments. And from his very beginning mission in Operation Snake Eater, starting as a noble foot soldier, to becoming himself a leader, and having a strong voice on world affairs, which would navigate him through the complexities of taking up such role. Within the very backdrop of the Cold War is what would shape Big Boss to become the man that he would be, tied into a complex system and considered an enemy to the superpowers amongst the world and a threat to their very organizations which shape a nation. Big Boss would be the enemy of the existence of nuclear superpowers that has altered the dynamics of global politics, shaping alliances, conflicts, and the pursuits of peace. Throughout Operation Snake Eater, Big Boss questions his loyalties and who exactly he really is serving his loyalties to, and would come to resent playing the pawn to superpowers narratives that shape a country. Something at the time that Big Boss would question to find his true purpose and loyalties as a soldier out in the field. One thing that his beloved disciple, the Boss, would truly understand. I can't teach you how to think. You'll just have to figure it out for yourself. Listen to me, Jack. Just because soldiers are on the same side right now doesn't mean they always will be. 
Having personal feelings about your comrades is one of the worst sins you can commit. Politics determine who you face on the battlefield. And politics are a living thing. They change along with the times. Yesterday's good might be tomorrow's evil. A soldier has to follow whatever orders he's given. It's not his place to question why. But you're looking for a reason to fight. You are a natural-born fighter, but you're not quite a soldier. A soldier is a political tool, nothing more. The horrors of war are etched in blood and suffering, with governments often at the forefront of perpetuating unspeakable atrocities. From ancient conflicts to modern warfare, the actions of rulers and regimes have left a trail of devastation and despair in their wake. Governments have also wielded the tools of war with ruthless efficiency, unleashing violence upon civilian populations, committing acts of genocide, and perpetuating widespread human rights abuses. The atrocities of wars know no bounds, transcending borders and ideologies as our power-hunger leader pursues their agendas at any cost. Throughout history, we have witnessed the barbarity of governments, from the systematic extermination of millions during the Holocaust to the indiscriminate bombing of civilian populations in conflicts such as World War II, Vietnam, and Syria. These acts of aggression and oppression leave scars that endure for generations, tearing apart families, communities, and entire nations, including soldiers themselves. Big Boss is the perfect example of being victimized within this geopolitical environment, being used nothing more as a tool for the United States government to fulfill their agendas. World leaders have often employed propaganda, censorship to conceal their atrocities, manipulating the public perception and obfuscating the truth from the suppression of a dissident to the distortion of historical narratives. It's always been the case that the machinery of state propaganda serves to sanitize the brutality and the reality of war and justifies anus hacks committed in the name of national interest. Where loyalties are bound to the systems through conformity of the propaganda machine, all of which are all the things that Big Boss would question throughout his mission, with being conflicted within determining where his loyalties truly lie, and beginning to understand the realities of the ugly truth of the political spectrum and how really it affects everybody. What about you, Jack? What's it going to be? Loyalty to your country or loyalty to me? Your country or your old mentor? The mission or your beliefs? Your duty to your unit or your personal feelings? There's a higher purpose driving Big Boss forward, the prevention of all-out nuclear war. As a pawn in a deadly game, Big Boss must navigate treacherous terrain, facing not only formidable enemies, but also the moral dilemmas that come with his mission. For Big Boss, success isn't just about personal glory or victory over his adversaries, it's about safeguarding the future of humanity. The specter of nuclear annihilation looms large, and every decision he makes carries weight, not just for himself, but for the world at large. As the viewer, we see Big Boss's challenges that they're not just witnessing a fictional hero's story. They're grappling with real-world implications of a global conflict and sacrifices required to prevent these catastrophes. Very such catastrophes that are created by such political events, which is ever so relevant in the world that we live today, where different nations across the globe still find themselves in meaningless competition in order to become the main powerful superpower. Yesterday's ally becomes today's opposition. And this Cold War? Think back. When I was leading the Cobras, America and Russia were fighting together. Now, consider whether America and Russia will still be enemies in the 21st century. Somehow I doubt it. Enemies change along with the times, the flow of the ages, and we soldiers are forced to play along. Instances of corruption inevitably emerged as individuals and institutions sought to exploit the circumstances for personal gain. At the highest levels of government, politicians and military leaders made decisions influenced by personal ambition, political expendency, or financial interest, as was the case for the philosopher's legacy, the amass of funds. Prior to the events in 1964, Volgin learned of the philosopher's legacy, following his father's death and illegally inherited a microfilm containing records of the enormous cachet of funds. Volgin conspired with the Brezhnev faction, anti-government groups and the military to overthrow Khrushchev's regime and seize power 
we are installing Leonid Brezhnev and Alexei Koskin in his place. Volgin later used the legacy as well as the help faction led by Brezhnev to construct the Groznygrad fortress in the mountains. He wanted to dispose Khrushchev, heat up the Cold War and win it in favor of Russia and unite the world under the USSR banner. From this moment on in the Cold War, it really was a race between ideologies such as communism and capitalism. Unbeknownst to the US, Volgin fired an American-made Davy Crockett at Sokolov's research facility, destroying it in a nuclear explosion as he felt they no longer had any use for it and framing the US for the whole ordeal, and knowing that this would spark the Cold War all that much more. With Khrushchev out of the way, also the US might have had their questionable stance within a controversy that surrounds President Kennedy's death. One of the most controversial and heavily debated events in modern America history while the official narrative points to Lee R.V. Oswald as being the lone gunman, many theories suggest a deeper, more sinister plot involving elements within the U.S. government. At the heart of these theories lies the notion of a shadow government, or a powerful group of people within the intelligence community and military-industrial complex who sought to remove Kennedy from power. The reasons behind such plot may vary, but no doubt may be just the same as what Colonel Volgin intended, by distinguishing the very peaceful treaties of what Khrushchev and Kennedy had achieved, by pulling nuclear missiles out of Cuba and forming a peaceful resolution between the United States and Russia. Kennedy's presidency was marked by numerous clashes within the military and intelligence establishment within the United States. He famously clashed with the CIA over the Bay of Pigs invasion and sought to reduce the agency's influence following the botched operation. In 1961, I was sent to Cuba, to Bahia de Cochinos. It was part of a CIA-sponsored invasion under the guise of taking Cuban exiles back to their country. But the U.S. government betrayed them. Our weak-kneed president held back their air support. Defenseless, the exiles were annihilated by the Cuban army. All I could do was watch in silence. I was set up by the very country I'd sacrificed so much for, by the very government I dedicated my life to defending. Additionally, Kennedy's advocacy for nuclear disarmament and his reluctance to escalate military intervention in Vietnam earned him enemies within the military-industrial complex. Kennedy's desire for greater transparency and cooperation with the Soviet Union, as evidenced by the Cuban Missile Crisis, and his attempts to detente may have irked hardline events and elements within the government who favored a more aggressive approach to the Cold War, just like that of the Soviet Union. And yet you say it was not acting under your orders. That's correct. You expect me to believe that this was all the work of a single soldier? I don't know what else to tell you. The army insists that this is all a ploy on your part. I've said it once and I'll say it again, our government had nothing to do with it. And I would like dearly to believe you. However, I'm afraid my power over the military has weakened since the Cuban incident. I will need some kind of proof that this was not the action of the American government. What if we can't prove our innocence? be unable to restrain the military. I will be ousted, and they will seek their revenge. A nuclear attack on the United States? I leave the disposal of this situation entirely to your discretion, Mr. President. Disposal? If you fail, it will mean the beginning of a new world war. In the decades following Kennedy's assassination, a plethora of conspiracy theories have emerged, pointing out to possible involvements of politics and governments by rogue elements within the CIA, the Mafia, or even foreign governments. While concrete evidence supports these theories, that remains elusive, lingering doubts surrounding Kennedy's death speaking to the enduring legacy of mistrust within governments, institutions, and the belief in hidden forces shaping world events. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security 
will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. In Metal Gear Solid, we see a very common pattern amongst characters within the game that are considered the antagonists or anti-heroes for those who are wishing to shape world order and the constructive economical events and civilization as a whole. Colonel Volgin would be no exception, of course neither would Big Boss, only to come within the timeline of Metal Gear of his story. Hideo Kojima has shed the spotlight on many events circulating the corruption from within, even governments betraying their own establishments to gain their own power and influence. Metal Gear Solid exemplifies the political nature that massively goes overlooked. A lot of the times we question, is it the presidents that we have in the United States or any other country in the world is nothing more than a figurehead, a tool for the governmental elite, for their own agendas, greed, powers and profits, and the conscription of soldiers that are used nothing more as an asset to further their goals. We can see this is demonstrated in Metal Gear Solid 3 as Big Boss finally understands the true nature of his very own government, and within it, the corruption of the CIA that continues to fester within the political world. the qualities of a soldier and an agent. The boss's defection was a ruse set up by the U.S. government. It was all a big drama staged by Washington so they could get their hands on the philosopher's legacy. And the boss was the star of the show. They planned it so that they could get the legacy that Colonel Volgan inherited and destroy the Shagohat at the same time. Only a legendary hero like the boss could have earned Volgan's trust. Finding out where the Philosopher's legacy was hidden was to be her greatest mission. Everything was going according to plan. As the legendary soldier known as Big Boss grappled with the aftermath of the boss's death, he found himself on a path of profound transformation. The loss of his mentor and mother figure shattered his worldview and left him questioning everything he once believed in. Haunted by guilt and betrayal, Big Boss's grief soon turned to anger and resentment towards governments and institutions he once served. In his eyes, that they had sacrificed the boss, a true patriot and hero, for the sake of a political expendency. This disillusionment with authority would shape Big Boss's future trajectory, leading him down a dark and tumultuous path becoming a leader in his own right. No longer bound by the constraints of loyalty or allegiance, he forged his own path, determined to create a world where soldiers like himself were free from the machinations of governments and ideologies. However, Big Boss embraced his role as a leader, his methods became increasingly ruthless and morally ambiguous. He became willing to sacrifice anything and anyone in pursuit of his vision, even if it meant betraying those closest to him. But this would just be the beginning of his journey to combat governments and nations, to give a place where soldiers are needed. In Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops, Big Boss emerges as a central figure, in the midst of the San Aronimo incident showcasing his prowess as a leader and a strategist. Tasked with thwarting a rogue faction's plot, Fox, his former unit, and Gene being the leader, to create a new world order. Big Boss assumes command of a ragtag group of soldiers, forging them into a formidable force capable of taking on the enemy. 
In this pivotal moment, Big Boss demonstrates his leadership skills by rallying his comrades and instilling a sense of purpose and unity amongst them, despite facing overwhelming odds and betrayal from within. He remains resolute in his mission, inspiring loyalty and camaraderie along his followers. Big Boss's actions in Portable Ops highlight his willingness to defy conventional norms and forge alliances with unlikely allies. By assisting the Soviet Union soldiers, he showcases pragmatism and strategic acumen, recognizing that sometimes the enemy of the your enemy can become a valuable ally. In the context of the San Jeronimo incident, Big Boss's decision to save the Soviet Union from nuclear destruction exemplifies his commitment to broader ideals of peace and stability despite being a former soldier of the United States. He prioritizes the greater good over national interests, demonstrating his capacity for empathy and compassion even in the midst of conflict. Ultimately, Big Boss's leadership in Portable Ops serves as a testament to his adaptability and resourcefulness and moral complexity through his actions. He is not the only one who emerges as a formidable warrior, but also a visionary leader willing to challenge the status quo and forge his own path in the pursuit of a better world. In Portable Ops, Gene, the charismatic leader of the renegade group known as Fox Unit, emerges as a formidable adversary to Big Boss. Gene's ultimate goal is to create a world free from the shackles of government control and manipulation, similar to Big Boss, where soldiers like himself can live and fight as they see fit. At first glance, Gene's vision may seem similar to Big Boss's own ideals of the soldier's autonomy and freedom from political manipulation, however, their approaches to achieving this goal differ significantly. While Big Boss seeks to create a world where soldiers are truly free to choose their own path, Gene's methods are more authoritarian, manipulative, he seeks to control and manipulate soldiers for the use of a powerful mind control device, which he believes will enable him to create the perfect army and achieve his vision of world domination. Ultimately, Gene's goals and his conflict with Big Boss serve to further define and shape the latter's character, pushing him to reaffirm his own ideas and values in the face of adversity. Though their clash, Big Boss is forced to confront the complexities of leadership and moral ambiguity of his own actions ultimately emerging as a more nuanced and introspective figure. The successor project. No. It was a top secret experiment conducted by the US government. Its goal to create the ultimate battlefield commander. The skills to wage war. The aptitude for strategy. The endurance to return from battle alive. And the charisma to overwhelm and master the hearts of soldiers. My voice is endowed with a special power. Another product of the successor project. And the soldier they chose as the model leader was none other than the legend herself. The boss. The boss. I received these gifts. I inherited them. Snake, you inherited the title of boss. You were her last disciple. You and I are like brothers. And as such, I couldn't possibly kill you now. Make yourself comfortable, brother. At the end of Ops, Big Boss would establish Foxhound. Big Boss seeks to create a force that is capable of operating independently, all from government oversight, embodying his vision of a world where soldiers have the autonomy to shape their own destinies. With assembling a team of elite operatives, Big Boss lays the groundwork for a new era of military operations, one defined by agility, innovation, and independence. However, as Foxhound takes shape, we also see the seeds of discord sown within its ranks, the divergent ideologies and personal ambitions of its members, including the likes of Gray Fox and Roy Campbell, foreshadowing the conflicts and betrayals that will come to define the unit's legacy in later installments of the Metal Gear series. Big Boss's decision to join forces with Major Zero and becoming a key figure in Cypher, the shadowy organization manipulating global affairs from behind the scenes, adds another layer of the complexity to Big Boss's character. While initially aligned with Zero's goals of creating a unified world governed by information control, Big Boss's eventual disillusionment with Cypher, methods and betrayal by his former ally will set the stage for his eventual descent and the formation of Outer Heaven. But Portable Ops would be the door that would open for Big Boss establishing his very first connection to branch out his military prowess into becoming a leader. Get out of here, Snake. And take this with you. What's this? 
the equipment, personnel, and funds I amassed in secret to build Army's Heaven. All the data is stored on that film. No one else knows about it. Why are you giving me this? Because you and I are the same. Someday, you'll be glad you have it. The one who fights and survives must carry on the legacy. Such is our fate. Go, Snake. I've said everything I need to. You are the one who will inherit my genes. You are the true successor. Be loyal to yourself. At the end of Portable Ops, Gene gave Big Boss funds to finance his own military nation. But we know that Portable Ops is meant to be considered not canon to the story, even though it's widely referenced in Peace Walker and Metal Gear Solid 4. So it's debatable whether or not this is really canon, given on the fact that in Peace Walker, Big Boss seems to have a very tough time establishing MSF, but me, myself, and others speculate that it was just enough funds to get MSF started up until he met Kaz. With the death of Gene, Big Boss would continue Army's Heaven, but with his own ideals, but still carrying some of the legacy of what Gene gave, because the two of them shared the similar goals and similar paths. The question is, who was Big Boss still loyal to? Was it himself? Was it his unit? Maybe it was both. Ultimately, Big Boss's loyalty is multifaceted. It's an aspect of his character, and it's shaped by his experiences, relationships, and personal convictions. And while he may prioritize his own ideals and aspirations, his actions are driven by a deeper sense of duty and honor, whether to himself, his comrades, or the greater good, as he perceives it. But one thing that we would know that would change later down his life has been a military leader, or perhaps maybe even a dictator. So what'll you do now, Snake? I don't know, but I've realized something. What's that? I'm not living unless I'm in battle, so I have to find my own reason to fight. I have to pass on what's been handed down to me. Take care, Snake. We'll meet again someday. Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, we witness Big Boss grappling with the immense responsibility of leadership in a world teetering on the brink of nuclear annihilation. As the founder of Military Sans Frontières, he's not just a soldier, but a commander, tasked with guiding his troops through a labyrinth of deceit and danger. The central conflict of Peace Walker revolves around the development of a nuclear-equipped AI Peace Walker, designed to ensure global peace through the threats of mutually assured destruction. Big Boss finds himself at the heart of the crisis, forced to confront the very real possibility of nuclear war and the role of his own organization plays in escalating tensions. In Peace Walker, Big Boss is confronted with a disturbing reality, the CIA's involvement in Costa Rica and the sinister plot orchestrated by Hart Coldman, a rogue operative within the agency. It's a tale of betrayal, manipulation, and the dangerous allure of unchecked power. Costa Rica, a seemingly peaceful nation, becomes the unsuspecting backdrop for a shadowy game of espionage and intrigue under the guise of aid and development projects. The CIA establishes a presence in the country, using it as a staging ground for covert operations and experiments. Kaz plays a significant role in helping Big Boss establish this military nation by being a right-hand man and a commander alongside the boss to guide him through the world of the economy and how to set up this new nation and explaining the very details of what MSF really is. Remember why we created MSF Snake? To provide military force to whoever needs it, wherever they are, regardless of nation or ideology. Our beliefs aren't all that lofty. We just won't be the tools of any one country. Exactly. We know only how to fight, but we refuse to live our lives at the whim of the state. What about you, Kaz? Any interest in expanding MSF? You'd better believe it. I want to make us into an organization that doesn't take orders from any country. Just like you were saying, we have to be strong. Strong enough to defend ourselves. We need money, too. Money to train soldiers to fight. The way I see it, we make MSF into something along the lines of a new kind of business. A contractor providing the full range of military services. Not just combat, but logistics, training, weapons, outfitting, and R&D. Combining the small footprint and exceptional performance of special forces with the raw military might of a full regular army. 
Only with that kind of power can we break free of nation states. So Big Boss faces the daunting challenge of building and sustaining a nation in the form of military sans frontiers, with limited resources and a motley crew of soldiers, as he embarks on his journey to transform his vision into a reality. One of the most crucial aspects of nation building is ensuring the basic needs of the population are met, and for Big Boss and MSF, this means securing food supplies in the lush jungles of Costa Rica, where MSF has established its base of operations just outside in the Caribbean. Big Boss and his soldiers employ a variety of methods to gather food, ranging from hunting and foraging to cultivating crops. But Big Boss's ambitions extend beyond mere survival. He envisions MSF as more than just a ragtag group of mercenaries. To achieve true autonomy and independence, MSF must become self-sufficient and economically viable, and so Big Boss sets its sights on securing his military contracts, offering MSF services to the governments and organizations in need of military assistance. By taking on these contracts, MSF not only earns the resources needed to sustain itself, but also establishes itself as a formidable force in the world of international military operations. Big Boss's strategic acumen and leadership skills enable MSF to tackle a wide range of missions from combat operations to intelligence gathering, further solidifying its reputation and influence on the global stage. Big Boss is an establishment. He is a government. In fact, Big Boss would be the very inspiration behind the wide range of PMC soldiers in the coming future of the Metal Gear Solid franchise. And with the up-and-coming age of artificial intelligence, the Cold War was still a thing, and a thing that affected both Big Boss and Kaz. Metal Gear Solid really sheds the spotlight on the corruptions between nations, all for power. It's been more than 10 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis, huh? I don't think we'll ever forget it. <laughs> no kidding. Those 13 days starting October 15, 1962, were probably the closest we ever came to all-out nuclear war. The Russians deployed nuclear missiles to Cuba. America responded with a naval blockade. Then Russia shot down an American spy plane. I was still a teenager back then, but I remember what it felt like to be one step away from nuclear war. The adults were freaking out. The CIA. As you both know, the United States views Central America as its backyard. Even after Cuba, we've managed to maintain a delicate balance with the US. And your government can't just give them the boot. We are not allowed to bear arms. Japan's constitution has something similar. Article 9. It says Japan renounces war and can maintain an army. I understand that you and your men have neither state nor ideology. That you will fight any foe. Please, you must drive them out of our defenseless country. So Big Boss emerges as a beacon of hope for the defenseless nation of Costa Rica, caught in the crosshairs of the corrupt CIA's covert operations. As a hero without a cape, he leads his bands of soldiers to Costa Rica's aid, embodying the spirit and solidarity and resilience. In a world where might often makes right, Costa Rica's decision to renounce war is a bold and principled stance against the tide of militarism and aggression, yet without an army to defend itself. The nation becomes vulnerable to exploitation by the nefarious forces like the CIA who seek to manipulate and control it for their own ends. At this point in Metal Gear Solid in Peace Walker, Big Boss is more or less a great leader, someone to be inspired by as he wishes to free nations from control and corrupt and deceitful governments. As he battles against the forces of tyranny and oppression, Big Boss becomes a symbol of resistance and defiance, inspiring others to join him in the fight for a better world. His actions remind us that true heroism isn't measured in victories won or battles fought, but in the courage to stand up and speak out against injustice no matter the cost. In the end, Big Boss's heroism in assisting Costa Rica and defending against tyrannical leaders serves as a reminder of the power of one person to make a difference in the world. He shows us that even in the face of overwhelming odds, a single individual can change the course of history and inspire others to do the same. But within the hypocrisy, Big Boss's reliance on military force and violence to achieve the vision of peace, despite advocating a world where soldiers are free from the control of governments and ideologies, with this MSF, is be effectively becoming a warlord himself. Big Boss's willingness to resort to extreme measures such as nuclear deterrence and the development of weapons of mass destruction raises the questions about the sincerity of his commitment to peace. 
While he may justify these actions as necessary evils to deter aggression and maintain stability, they ultimately perpetuate the cycle of violence and conflict that he claims to oppose. Because Big Boss would become a nuclear power himself, and essentially would develop a nuclear weapon of his own by using Metal Gear as being the guard and being the very deterrent itself to oppose governments. You know, Snake, you're right. As long as we're soldiers without borders, we're going to be a target. We need our own deterrent. Yeah, we're going to be stepping into a lot of different conflicts as we roam the world. Each one unique, and with its own set of geography, ideologies, and politics. If we're going to intervene in those kinds of situations, we need the threat of a Metal Gear. Unless we want to end up like Che Guevara did in Bolivia. Uh, well said. Our army without borders doesn't have a land to call home. We're nomads. Wanderers. What we need now is a sheepdog to guard our flock. Right. Maybe it's not the way the boss would have gone about it, but there are places in this world that need us. Whilst Big Boss may be guilty all the same as the rest of the other governments that have such power of deterrence, it's a means to an end that Big Boss knows that he can capitalize on in order to deter nations and corrupt governments from invasion and exploitation. Given on the fact that he's now a military power, he needs to be able to defend himself and to keep other orders within check, and not to be ultimately victimized like Costa Rica, which is a nation that can't defend itself. Essentially, deterrence is a strategy employed by nuclear powers to prevent nuclear conflict, by threatening devastating retaliation in a response to an attack. The idea is that the fear of a mutual destruction will dissuade adversaries from launching a nuclear strike, thus maintaining a delicate balance of power and preventing all-out war. Treaties such as the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and various arms controls agreements are international agreements aimed at limiting the spread of nuclear weapons and reducing the risk of nuclear war. With the concept of mutually assured destruction known as MAD is central to the deterrence strategy. MAD points that the sheer destructive power of nuclear weapons makes any nuclear conflict unwinnable, as both sides would suffer catastrophic losses. Therefore, the rational course of action for nuclear powers is to avoid initiating a nuclear attack, knowing that it will result in their own destruction. Whilst the Torrance has been credited for preventing nuclear war during the Cold War and beyond, it also carries significant risks and challenges. The reliance on nuclear weapons as a deterrent creates a constant threat of accidental or an intended escalation, as well as the potential for deliberate acts of aggression or miscalculation. They say nuclear weapons are the reason we haven't seen conflict on a global scale since World War II. The thought that your opponent might launch nukes against you sort of makes it tough to start an armed conflict, especially now that they've got intercontinental ballistic missiles. Nowhere is safe. Of course, all that has caused military expenditures to skyrocket. Well, the only way to ward off a preemptive strike is to flaunt your own nuclear stockpile. And that's caused their numbers to increase exponentially. Not just with regards to destructive power, but in terms of targeting technology, too. Now they can hit a target halfway across the world with pinpoint accuracy. In a way, the space race was a demonstration of that technological progress. And as a result of all that, we now have mutually assured destruction. It's the ultimate form of deterrence. No one's going to launch their nukes knowing they'll be obliterated in return. I don't know. The chance of somebody hitting the button by mistake is never zero. In the race for global domination, Hot Coldman is a disillusioned CIA operative. This guy is a central figure within Peace Walker, one that threatens the very existence of the world itself and Big Boss's outfit. He has a chilling vision for the future, recognizing the potential of artificial intelligence to revolutionize warfare. Coldman sets out to create a Peace Walker, an AI-controlled nuclear weapon capable of enforcing peace through the threat of annihilation. But behind Coldman's facade of patriotism lies darker troops, his willingness to sacrifice innocent lives and manipulate world events to achieve his own goals. He's out of his mind. What does he think's gonna happen? When they get hit by rain containing high concentrations of fallout, a lot of them will die from the external exposure alone. The rain will seep into the ground, contaminating the water supply and crops. When they ingest the stuff, the internal exposure starts. Strontium-90 and cesium-137 have half-lives of around 30 years. The effects stay with you your entire life. Leukemia, cataracts, dermatitis, cancer. And it affects reproduction, too. I know. Even today, 30 years after...
but the CIA's involvement in Coleman's plot is a stark reminder of the dangers of unchecked power and the corrupting influence of secrecy and deception. It's a portrayal of the principles of democracy and transparency as the government agencies pursue their own agendas at the expense of the public good. Humans are incapable of destroying themselves. But an AI wouldn't hesitate to push the button. Precise. Making it the one real deterrent. If people hesitate, lose their nerve. Isn't that why deterrence theory works in the first place? No. Machines don't make mistakes. Only men do. That's why a fully automated, mechanized deterrent like Peace Walker is needed. Once our system is embraced, Langley will again turn its attention to Latin America as the cockpit of the new Cold War. Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama. Peace Walker will be deployed along Central America's entire Caribbean coast. All of North America, South America, and the West Indies will be within its range. We'll bring law and order to the entire continent. Not only Coldman, but at the same time, Big Boss's possession of a nuclear weapon makes him a target for other governments and nations who view MSF as a potential threat to global stability. He must navigate through the delicate balance of power, knowing that one wrong move could plunge the world into chaos. Big Boss is no stranger to saving the world from all-out nuclear catastrophe, but at the same time, he himself is a deterrent. By holding nuclear weapons himself, becomes a nuclear threat nonetheless. Cypher, the shadowy organization lurking in the corridors of power, pulling the strings of governments and manipulating events from behind the scenes. That's Cypher, a secrecy entity, far-reaching connections, and a pen chart for orchestrating chaos to further its own agenda. And also within Costa Rica, which becomes a pawn in Cypher's game. Cypher's control over the United States isn't over-explicit. It operates behind the scenes, pulling the strings and exerting pressure to advance its own agenda through a combination of Kosair and blackmail and subtle manipulation. Cypher infiltrates government agencies and influences decision-making processes to serve its own goals. Key figures within the US government from high-ranking officials, lawmakers, are unwittingly or willingly co-opted by Cypher, becoming pawns in the grand scheme of the geopolitical chess. Cypher's control isn't just limited to government, it extends into the realms of industry, finance, and media. The very organization that would be a massive threat to Big Boss. Which unbeknownst to him, Cypher manipulates events to frame MSF for a nuclear attack, trying to blackmail Big Boss to join the very outfit, casting Big Boss as the villain in a desperate bid to maintain its grip on power. Zeke is already in nuclear strike mode. What? I'm taking the weapon you built and using it to launch a nuclear strike on the east coast of the United States. You're insane. What are you after? But wait. Here is your consolation prize. We are about to show the world just how dangerous a gang of outlaws, an army without borders, can be. You and your men will become pariahs, and you will be wiped off the face of the earth. Rather than heroes, you will be seen as a well-armed extremist cult prone to indiscriminate outbursts of nuclear aggression. You will give rise to a new world order. Big Boss really emerges as a true hero, risking everything to save even America, who are his opposition, from the brink of nuclear devastation. As the tensions reaching a boiling point, the fate of the world hangs in the balance. Absolute move of bravery and leadership, Big Boss would report the false nuclear launch data sent by Hot Coldman, which was initialized by Peace Walker, that was tricking the Pentagon system into believing that a strike was imminent from the Soviets. Of course, this would be the very thing that kept the world on edge, but Big Boss would buy precious time to destable Peace Walker and avert all-out disaster. In the end, Big Boss's selfless actions saved millions of lives and prevented a global catastrophe. Though his reputation may have been tarnished and his name vilified, his sacrifice will be remembered as a true act of heroism in dark moments. Peace Walker shows exactly why Big Boss is a great example of a leader rather than a dictator, at least at this point, demonstrating not only to his own outfit and military unit, but to global powers that be all across the world the dangers of corruption that take place within governments. Ultimately, it would be thanks to the boss's persona within the AI pod that would shut down this nuclear launch, which thankfully happened when it did, otherwise the entire world would be up in flames. You saved us all, big boss. We'll stand down the alert. <sighs> Thank you.
When we meet again, I hope you'll shake my hand. Look! There's no peace to be found anywhere. And so we can only keep on hoping. Hoping for the illusion we call peace. At the conclusion of Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, Big Boss stands triumphant, having established his private military company, Military Sans Frontiers, as a formidable force on the global stage. With MSF's reputation solidified and its capabilities demonstrated, Big Boss in Kazakh's new nation represents a paradigm shift in the world of warfare and geopolitics. This newfound freedom heralds a new era of warfare, one characterized by the rise of private military companies, just as we see in Metal Gear Solid 4. As key players in international conflicts with their advanced weaponry and elite soldiers and willingness to operate in the shadows, PMCs blur the lines between state and non-state actors, complicating the already murky landscape of global security. As Big Boss leads his nation forward into the unknown, knowing that the times will shape and determine the events of the future, just as the boss explained to him, he carries with him the dreams and aspirations of the soldiers everywhere, while shaping the boss's will into his own ideals, proving that even in the midst of chaos, there is potential for a better future, under the illusion of peace. In this moment, there is no turning back, as Big Boss is now well established within the military world, where conflicts and battles are a long bloody war. Despite Big Boss's love and admiration for the boss and her will, he himself would become to resent the likes of what the boss fought for, believing that everything that she sacrificed for the sake of the country that betrayed her really was considered to him betrayal. Big Boss couldn't reconcile the boss's decision to lay down her weapon and allow herself to be killed. In Big Boss's eyes, this act symbolized not only a betrayal on their shared ideals and mission, but also a disregard for her own life. He struggled to comprehend how someone he admired and respected so deeply could willingly sacrifice herself in such a manner, especially after she entrusted him with her final mission. The sense of betrayal and confusion lingered with Big Boss, leaving him to grapple with conflicting emotions and questions about the loyalty, duty, and the true nature of sacrifice, and really what the boss's will intended to do, and the impact it would have onto the world. Snake, you don't mean... I'm done looking for the truth. What are you saying, Snake? I was wrong. Come on, boss. Everybody's waiting for you. She betrayed me, Kaz. She what? In the end, she put down her gun. And when she did, she rejected her entire life up to that point. Including me. What do you mean? In giving up her life, she abandoned everything she was as a soldier. And you consider that betrayal? I won't make the same choice as her. My future is going to be different. Then? Yeah, that's right. From now on, call me Big Boss. In the intricate world of Metal Gear Solid V, Big Boss emerges as a formidable and controversial figure. 
wielding immense power. His possession of a secret nuclear weapon, concealed from the watchful eyes of international inspectors, raises profound questions about the nature of his influence and the dangers he poses to global security. Big Boss's status as a nuclear power with an undisclosed arsenal presents a complex and multifaceted threat to the world order. On one hand, his military prowess and strategic acumen make him a force to be reckoned with, capable of shaping the course of world events and challenging the dominance of traditional nation-states. Yet the clandestine nature of Big Boss's nuclear capabilities raises troubling questions about accountability and transparency. By concealing his weapon from the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, and other international bodies, he undermines the principles of nuclear non-proliferation and the delicate balance of power established by the Treaty of Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. The danger posed by Big Boss's secret weapon is compounded by the lack of oversight and regulation, leaving the world vulnerable to the whims of a single individual without proper safeguards in its place. Big Boss's profound impact extends beyond the confines of the game's universe, resonating with real-world issues surrounding militias, private military companies, terrorism, and the dangers of acquiring a nuclear material for weapons of mass destruction. His vision of a world where soldiers are free from constraints of nations, allegiances, and ideologies mirrors the realities of today's global landscape, where militias, insurgent groups, and PMCs operate with increasing autonomy and influence. The proliferation of PMCs in particular has raised concerns about their role in conflicts around the world. With their access to advanced weaponry and military expertise, PMCs have the potential to destabilize regions and exacerbate existing conflicts, all while operating outside the traditional frameworks of state sovereignty and international law. The threat of terrorism and the specter of weapons of mass destruction looms large in the modern world. The ease with which terrorist organizations can acquire nuclear material or other dangerous technologies poses a grave danger to global security, highlighting the urgent need for advanced cooperation and vigilance among nations. This is a cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked ambition and the potential consequences of following a non-state actors to acquire weapons of mass destruction. While the events of this game may be fictional, they serve a stark reminder for the very real threats facing the world today and the need for collective action to address them. Snake, yesterday we received official communication from the IAEA. It says, it has come to our attention that your organization recently purchased nuclear fuel from Uzbekistan authorities. We request permission to inspect your facilities. Let alone a bullshit. Yeah. They're after Metal Gear Zeke's nuclear warhead. I'm betting this is payback from Cypher after Paz's leak. Using the UN. There's no telling how much influence they have. But the IAEA can only do inspections in countries that are party to the NPT. And we're not a country. Exactly. We haven't signed a safeguards agreement with the IAEA over peaceful nuclear use, and we're not obligated to report any nuclear material we have, nor information about any nuclear facilities. The IAEA has no authority to inspect us. But despite all that... That nuke's our last line of defense. We don't want to announce we have it until the world is preparing to wipe us off the map. Until then, we let everyone think we're just a private army with conventional firepower. What's Huey's take? That the problem's how to hide the nuke in Metal Gear. But I gotta tell you, he was all for it. I see. But there's no way we can have the IAEA poking around here. So what do we do? Ignore them? Send them an official letter of refusal. Say that we're a private organization and we've done nothing to attract the suspicion. You got it. As the charismatic leader of MSF, Big Boss embodied a new paradigm in warfare, one characterized by autonomy, flexibility, and profit. His vision of a world where soldiers operated outside the traditional constraints of government authority and national allegiance struck a chord with those disillusioned by the limitations of conventional military service. Inspired by Big Boss's example, entrepreneurs and opportunists seized upon the burgeoning PMC industry, eager to capitalize on the lucrative opportunities it presented. With access to advanced weaponry, military expertise, these new formerly PMCs quickly became a potent force in global conflicts, offering their services to the highest bidder without regard 
of consequences. Big Boss's influence didn't stop there. His reputation as a legendary soldier and leader inspired a legion of followers, including those with less noble intentions. Individuals and organizations with nefarious agendas saw in Big Boss a template for achieving their own ambitions, whether it be amassing wealth and power or exacting revenge on their enemies. Whilst Big Boss's intentions may have been noble, the ripple effects of his actions continue to shape the world long after his time. Ocelot said the number of private forces is increasing, and they've modeled themselves after us. They're a far cry from the likes of us. But why? Nine years ago, we made enemies of the world as a nuclear-equipped force, independent of ideology or state. Yes. Sooner or later, the real UN would have stepped in. So why are they giving these PFs free reign? That's our fault, too. What do you mean? What happened nine years ago was a real problem for a lot of people. An organization as big as ours, with our facilities, was wiped off the map. Not an easy thing to hide. But if our existence came to light, so would the names of our clients. We had contracts all over, east and west, from superpowers to banana republics, the lot. Our clients denied all association with the likes of us. They had to make sure things didn't blow up on them. But at the same time, they missed us. They really missed us. The demand for armies for hire was as strong as ever. The international community turned a blind eye to what happened to us, despite still needing people who could do our jobs. History couldn't afford to lose us. As soon as we were gone, they needed a replacement. So private forces spread everywhere. And they're all just a phone call away. But still... I know. PFs are totally different from what we envisioned. Nation states, revolutionaries, terrorists... They have a lot of clients. And Cypher is one of them. Cypher stays anonymous. But I know their work when I see it. In the eyes of those clients, the world's PFs are all just expendable pawns. The clients don't have to worry about losing their own men. Nobody knows they're involved. And PFs are cheap. In short, the world is chewing up soldiers and spitting them out. Even some of the old Mother Base's survivors are still working for PFs. Some guys created their own smaller forces. Others were taken on by emerging PFs. Everybody's gone their separate ways. But none of them are living their dream. Because they're not fighting with you. Big Boss descent into questionable morals is exemplified by his decision to keep a childlike Chico in his unit. This highlights the ethical complexities and moral dilemmas inherent in warfare and leadership. Chico's presence in military San Frontiers reflects the harsh realities of conflict zones, where children are often drawn into the fray as soldiers or support personnel. While Big Boss may have justified his decision to keep Chico in MSF as a means for protecting him from the dangers of the outside world, the impact of this choice on Chico's well-being and mental health cannot be ignored. By exposing Chico to the brutal realities of war and violence, Big Boss inadvertently perpetuated a cycle of trauma and suffering that ultimately led to Chico's demise. In hindsight, Big Boss should have recognized the inherent danger of vulnerability of having a child like Chico in his unit, and taken steps to ensure his safety and well-being. This could have included prioritizing Chico's rehabilitation and education, providing him with the necessary support and resources to reintegrate into civilian life, and ultimately facilitating his return to a safe and stable environment. In the end, Big Boss's decision to keep Chico in his unit ultimately cost him his life underscoring the tragic consequences of unchecked ambition and questionable moral choices. There was naturally a lot to digest within Ground Zeroes, especially being in Big Boss's sneaking suit, considering the fact that he had to rescue both Chico and Paz whilst having to maintain a military leadership, and given on the false inspection that was evidently shown that people within his own unit that he entrusted would be his downfall. And with the very destruction of Mother Base, we could start to see the separation of ideologies and loyalties, and Big Boss's beliefs had changed, along with his mentality becoming more ruthless along the way, demonstrating how really enemies can become friends and friends can become enemies just as easily as the wind changes. Politics and a march of time can turn friends into enemies just as easily as the wind changes. Ridiculous, isn't it? The betrayal and the loss he experienced at the hands of Skullface 
and the Exoweth forces shattered his trust and sense of loyalty, leaving him with a deep-seated bitterness and a newfound cynicism towards the world. Prior to the attack on MSF, Big Boss had been driven by a sense of purpose and camaraderie, leading his soldiers with a strong sense of loyalty and conviction. However, the devastating loss of his comrades and the destruction of everything he had built shook him to his core, causing him to question his beliefs and values once again. In his desperation to seek vengeance against Cypher, he abandoned the very soldiers who stood by his side, leaving them to fend for themselves in the wake of MSF's destruction. As he journeyed into the abyss of his own despair, Big Boss became increasingly ruthless, unscrupulous in the pursuit of power and retribution, that in fact he would forget his old former units and wouldn't even try to reach out to them whilst they were trying to reach out to Big Boss. In the end, the destruction of MSF painted a picture of the larger broad prospect of what war brings to the table. The camaraderie aside and the fun in the games don't put aside the true nature of what war has. It's ambiguous and it is littered with uncertainty and as Big Boss would find himself in a conflict he wouldn't even expect at this point. The reality is the true nature of Big Boss's lifestyle could never be peaceful. Whether he told himself it could be, in reality, war still remains as war. As Big Boss ascended further into the abyss, he left behind a trail of broken dreams and shattered lives, a testament to the corrosive power of betrayal and the fragility of loyalty in the face of overwhelming despair. In the events of Phantom Pain, Big Boss would re-establish himself, and in fact, Cypher would appoint the new Snake, Venom Snake, who would take the role of Big Boss, as being now the new face of the world as Big Boss's cover. The tragedy of this is we see Venom Snake is involvement within Big Boss's larger plot, and Cypher, of course, being nothing more than an expendable pawn along many others, such as the Diamond Dark Soldiers, they find themselves not fighting for their own ideologies and beliefs as soldiers. They are no longer an army without a nation. They are an army controlled under an organization that is in cover of a nation. The Phantom Pain touches up on many topics, but in terms of loyalties, deceit, manipulation, because events that take place here are just constructed lies. For those who are playing into a larger game, and really have no idea really the meaning behind it. Unbeknownst to Venom Snake, Big Boss's greatest commander, or ally at the time, would actually re-establish Mother Base alongside Kaz. Unknowingly and unbeknownst to him, his true position within all of this. Big Boss's departure and betrayal of his former comrades, including Venom Snake and the soldiers of Diamond Dogs, is a gut-wrenching tale of shattered trust and broken bonds. Big Boss's bitterness and first revenge against Cypher drive him to forget what's important, as of course being a leader, rather than just being a tyrannical dictator. Big Boss's bitterness and thirst for revenge against Cypher drives him to abandon those he once fought alongside him. Despite the sacrifices made and the loyalty shown, he turns his back on Venom Snake and Diamond Dogs, leaving them to grapple with the aftermath of MSF, and then also including having to clear up the mess of Skullface and XOF can see that Big Boss's loyalty is diminished. His very own unit would follow him to the grave, but the very fact that Big Boss would show no interest once he'd fully recovered to at least give assistance to Venom on the other side 
is really quite telling of his character at this point. This just makes the brilliance of Venom Snake's character highlighted as we see that there isn't just a great soldier with fantastic abilities. This guy isn't a leader. He was a commander or somebody who served alongside Big Boss as being one of his greatest soldiers. He has no experience in terms of being a leader per se, but does it with ease and in fact would do it better than Big Boss by making some of the right moral choices. In the wake of Venom Snake becoming the new leader to Diamond Dogs and them finding out the truth, of course they would become to respect the man that they know now as their boss. A boss who made different decisions from the big boss that we knew later on in Outer Heaven that would make some questionable moral decisions. Venom Snake really is the definition of loyalty. But sorry to disappoint, it's not his story. I have to use Venom Snake in order to describe the eventual downfall of Big Boss and his character for this analysis. We'll no doubt at some point get an analysis of his own. Dogs of war for nine whole years. That ends today. Now you're not sleeping, and we're not junkyard hounds. We're diamond dogs. Let them talk. We can crush Cypher Boss. And you can build the army that can do it. Just one thing, Cos. This isn't about the past. We're fighting for the future. This for me is a highlighted segment. It comes to show that Venom Snake realizes that he can't live on fighting the past. Even though he's plagued by his own phantoms, and understandably so, but it seems like Big Boss is still plagued by his past, and in fact is the very reason that descends him into madness. It's a heart-wrenching betrayal that cuts deep, leaving Venom Snake and the Diamond Dogs grappling with the feelings of abandonment and betrayal for them. Big Boss was more than just a leader. He was a mentor, a friend, a brother, someone to depend on. To see him walk away in their darkest hour feels like a betrayal of everything they once believed in. And yet despite the hurt and the sense of betrayal, there's also a profound sense of loss, a recognition that Big Boss's departure marks the end of an era, the final nail in the coffin of their shared dreams and aspirations. As Diamond Dogs and Venom Snake pick up the pieces and forge ahead without him, they're left to grapple with a painful realization that sometimes even the heroes we look up to can fall far from grace. Venom Snake's intentions with Salamphropus diverge significantly from Big Boss's approach. Big Boss would see Salamphropus primarily as a powerful weapon to further his own agenda, whereas Venom Snake views it as something more nuisanced, a symbol of defiance, a message to the world. For Venom Snake, Salamphropus represents a statement, a declaration of independence and strength in the face of oppression. Rather than deploying it as a blunt instrument of destruction, he sees it as a symbol of resistance, a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there is hope and defiance. Unlike Big Boss, whose ambitions are driven by a first for power and revenge, Venom Snake's motivations are rooted in a desire for justice and freedom. He recognizes the potential for Salamphropus to inspire others to galvanize them into action against tyranny and oppression. We hold our rifles in missing hands. We stand tall on missing legs. We stride forward on the bones of our fallen. Then, and only then, are we alive. This pain is ours, and no one else's. A secret weapon we wield, out of sight. We will be stronger than ever. For our peace. That guy's crush on Sahelanthropus is beyond a joke. Guess he really wants to see his tech stand on its own two legs this time. That's not gonna happen. I know it. So you've got no plans to make it operational again? Damn right. Boss, I want to hear it straight from you. Hear what? What the hell do you want with that thing? The drive is busted. It's not like it has a nuke on board. Even if the metallic archaic could turn it into a nuclear weapon, all it can do is self-destruct. Cephalanthropus just isn't a weapon anymore. 
It'll draw unwanted attention without even being a deterrent. I know. The weapon's development strut sank two feet under that thing's wake. That's one year's drop in a single night. We've started on reinforcing the strut, but there's no guarantee it'll hold up if a storm hits. I know that, too. Boss, why keep it? It's a mark. Uh, us diamond dogs, we don't have a country to call home. That means we have no past, nothing to prove that we lived. Every one of us threw it all away when we came here. Sahalanthropus is a symbol to show that the likes of us brought at least one crisis to its end. A mark in history. So we can't just fade away. It's of no practical use to us. But we still need it. A symbol of what we've done. And Venom Snake's approach to nuclear weapons stands in stark contrast to that of Big Boss. While Big Boss sees nuclear weapons as a means to assert dominance and further his own agenda, Venom Snake has no interest in their development. In fact, he actively works to disarm them from other private forces, recognizing the inherent danger they pose to global security. For Venom Snake, nuclear weapons represent the ultimate form of destruction, a Pandora's box that once opened cannot be closed. He understands the catastrophic consequences of their use and is unwilling to risk the lives of innocent people for the sake of power or revenge. Instead, Venom Sneak seeks to rid the world of nuclear weapons altogether, recognizing that their mere existence threatens the safety and stability of the planet. He understands that the true power lies not in the ability to destroy, but in the ability to build and create and shape the future. A philosophy that guides his actions as he works tirelessly to dismantle the nuclear arsenals of other private forces. Something in the end wouldn't stay true, as Venom Snake wouldn't only be betrayed, he would betray himself and his own ideals for the sake of Big Boss. Nuclear disarmament. Boss, we can't let this achievement go to waste. And that means we'll have to get stronger. No nuclear program will go unseen. Someone manages to build another nuke, we'll be there to shut him down. The context of the nuclear disarmament scene, we know that it's not only just a message that Hideo Kojima tried to give the fans about a profound warning of the nuclear weapons that still pose a threat today. As the years have dissipated over the years after the Cold War, whilst the nuclear weapons have gone down within numbers, they still are actively alive. And then given on today in 2024, it's looking ever seemingly that a new Cold War could be brewing. It seems like history is repeating itself once again. But in regards to this nuclear disarmament scene, I believe that showcase what Venom Snake actually did. Aside from this being just an FOB for online players, it was so much more. And in fact, if it wasn't real, it's a broad concept and a vision of what Venom Snake would have intended for the world to be, nuclear free. Venom Snake's actions in rescuing African child soldiers and offering them a chance at a new life stands as a testament to his admirable morals and humanity. Unlike Big Boss who famously recruited child soldiers during the Zanzibar land disturbance, Venom Snake refuses to perpetuate the cycle of violence and exploitation that plagues war-torn regions. For Venom Snake, the plight of child soldiers strikes a deep chord, reflecting the tragic consequences of conflict and the vulnerability of those caught in his crossfire. He recognizes that these children are victims, not perpetrators, and is determined to offer them a path towards redemption and rehabilitation. Even risking his own life in the process, Venom Snake goes above and beyond to rescue and protect these vulnerable young souls, providing them with the opportunity to live a life free from the horrors of war. Venom Snake's loyalties really do hold no bounds. They'll have their own quarters, separate from ours. Won't be counted as staff. So what, we're running a daycare now? To learn how to read and write. Do basic jobs. Chance at a real life. Just not from behind a gun. Anyone here can use a knife or a gun. What you're gonna learn is how to use your head. Let's move! Outbreak in the laboratory. The quarantine platform. 
We sent a team to investigate and recover the survivors, but they haven't returned. There's nothing on the radio either. We got a backup team ready to go. Just give the order and I'll, I'll go alone. Boss, what are you... There's no need for that. We can't afford to lose anyone else. Venom Snake's profound love and loyalty towards his soldiers are exemplified by his courageous actions, such as risking infection to rescue them from the quarantine facility. This unwavering dedication mirrors that of his former leader, Big Boss, who once shared a similar bond with his troops. However, while Big Boss's leadership eventually turned towards dictatorship and manipulation, Venom Snake's commitment to his soldiers remained steadfast. The burden of Venom Snake having to take the lives of his own comrades weighs like a leaden anchor on his heart, dragging him into the sea of sorrow and remorse. Each fallen soldier is not just a casualty of war, but a cherished friend, a brother in arms, lost of the merciless tide of conflict. With every pull of the trigger, Venom feels the weight of their sacrifices pressing down upon him, a relentless reminder of the cruel choices he must make to ensure the survival of those he loves and to prevent the infection that could infect the world. The echoes of their voices haunt his dreams, their faces etched into his memory, their ashes forged into diamonds to be taken everywhere that he goes. This is a silent testament to the heavy toll of leadership and the agony of loss. Yet even amidst the darkness, Venom finds solace in flickering flame of his unwavering loyalty and devotion to his fallen comrades, a beacon of hope guiding him through the darkest of nights, one that Big Boss couldn't find the light and see through at the time. Venom Snake walks through the same corridors once walked by Big Boss. It is a haunting reflection of his own descent into darkness, as he treads in the footsteps of his former mentor. He grapples with the tragic truth of leadership, that the path to power is often paved with sacrifice and suffering. The shrapnel embedded in his head serves as a constant reminder of the demon within. Like a twisted crown of thorns, it symbolizes the burden of his sins and the darkness that threatens to consume him with each step of the weight of the shrapnel presses down on him, a tangible manifestation of the demon that lurks within his soul as he follows in the footsteps of his former mentor. Venom is haunted by the knowledge that he too may succumb to the same fate, the very fate that he wouldn't ask for, but one fate that he would gladly take on to his own by assisting Big Boss within Outer Heaven. I won't scatter your sorrow to the heartless sea. be with you. Plant your roots in me. With the whole world wanted Big Boss dead, Venom Snake would sadly have to take the burden. As well as being considered a traitor by his former MSF unit with members that survived a while back. Some of you guys remember a mission called Retake the Platform in where the lead commander at the time believed Big Boss was behind the attack all them years ago to go into hiding. No doubt it was a misinformation media campaign that was sprued up by the likes of Cypher as Big Boss well and truly was the most wanted man in the world. Most of Big Boss's intentions against Cypher was good. Of course, he wished to eliminate what he believed to be people that was trying to cause the global enslavement. 
through misinformation, controlling economy and politics, Big Boss had a good reason to want to abolish Cypher. Unfortunately, that meant giving up his humanity in order to extract revenge. Boss, we figured out who that enemy commander was. He was on the staff at Mother Base nine years back. Despite surviving the attack, he broke off from us and spent his years terrified that a cleanup squad would come after him. The isolation screwed with his sense of loyalty. A rumor, source unknown, had him convinced that the attack nine years ago was orchestrated by you yourself. The big boss sold out his comrades to hide from the world. He thought that's why you weren't at the base that day. He was so desperate to take us down, he built up his own PF, copying us in every way. His idea of the perfect revenge. But in the end, he was just a victim of disinformation. And from here on out, you're a big boss. The mirror and Venom Snake is a symbolic act of rejecting the false identity that had been imposed upon him. The mirror reflects not his true self, but the visage of Big Boss, the legendary soldier whose identity he had been forced to assume. By shattering the mirror, Venom symbolically breaks free from the confines of false persona and asserts his own individuality. It represents a moment of defiance and self-realization as Venom rejects his role that had been a thrust upon him and embraces the Big Boss identity along with his own. Additionally to the act of smashing the mirror, we also see a cathartic release of pent-up emotions and frustrations, allowing Venom to confront his inner demons and begin the journey towards self-discovery. Within that journey would leave out his own ideals to join Big Boss's will and continue on as a nuclear superpower in the coming years of Outer Heaven where he would face Big Boss's son. In Metal Gear lore, Venom Snake's role in Outer Heaven and his collaboration with Big Boss to dismantle the Patriots represents a pivotal moment within the series' narrative. It's really there where we get to take a good look of Big Boss's character to go from him being a leader to a downright dictator. Within all this is really just a true means to an end. There is no good or evil, right or wrong. After the Phantom Pain, Big Boss appeared in numerous territorial and ethnic conflicts. That's where also where he met Frank Yeager once again, rescuing him from imprisonment and torture. Big Boss would actually take Frank Yeager and Naomi to the United States, where he helped them establish normal lives, showing that there is still a good-spirited side of him, even though he is conflicted from within. That even though the whole world wanted his head, there were still people who widely respected him and saw his vision and his will has been a just cause that needed to happen to prevent the world from being under control for secret societies. And he brought you back to America? No. I was in Mozambique when he came. Who was he? You mean Big Boss? Yes. He brought us to this land of freedom, this America. And then he and my brother went back to Africa to continue the war. Big Boss would achieve a near mythical status due to his extraordinary military career and his exploits of Venom Snake, earning him the legendary soldier moniker. He was heralded as a true hero and made the front covers of popular magazines in many countries. And at some point afterwards, he'd serve as a combat instructor who worked on to reintegrate former child soldiers into society. And one of them was a young sniper wolf whom he'd rescued from a harsh upbringing and raised as a soldier. Sniper Wolf wasn't the only one exploited amongst many child soldiers, in which Big Boss would recruit to his own meaning and cause, showing the true downfall and descent into his absolute dictatorship. Big Boss has been known for many names, from Naked Snake to Vic Boss, from Ishmael, and all the way to the notorious Saladin. While Cypher may have held the grand control over the most important features that run the world, Big Boss was no exception to the fact that his influence was so large and powerful that he was well known worldwide for his exploits. Each morning I'd wake up and find a few more of my family or friends dead beside me. I'd 
stare at the morning sun and pray to make it through the day. The governments of the world turned a blind eye to our misery. But then, he appeared. My hero. Saladin. He took me away from all that. Saladin? You mean Big Boss? I became a sniper. At some point in the early 1990s, Big Boss would return to the U.S. once again to take command of Foxhound. While serving as Foxhound's commander, he secretly built up his mercenary company, Outer Heaven, into a larger military establishment with Venom Snake acting as his stead. During this time, he was responsible for the wild and instinctive strategies utilized by Foxhound during operations, which often appeared to be planned with little caution and detail. And it was in 1995 when the USA learned of Metal Gear's development in Outer Heaven. Big Boss commissioned Foxhound to infiltrate the fortified nation and destroy the weapon before anyone else so he could at least buy Venom Snake some time to finish the TX-55 Metal Gear. By acquiring and developing the TX-55 Metal Gear, Big Boss aims to tip the balance of power in the favor of Outer Heaven. Once again, just like he did with Military San Frontiers, only this time with a more ruthless approach. Positioning his fortress as a significant player on the global stage, with the threat of nuclear retaliation right at their disposal, Big Boss and his forces seek to deter potential adversaries and secure their independence from outside control that the Patriots seems to have on the world. So we see the desperation within Big Boss's decision making, as he uses his very own son Solid Snake from the Foxhound unit to be the palm of an outer heaven as he expected Solid Snake not to accomplish his mission and would fall at the hands of Venom Snake. But not only that as well, before he sent Solid Snake, Grey Fox was sent in to investigate Outer Heaven, only just to be captured. Big Boss became what he hated through a combination of betrayal and disillusionment. In fact, the very thing he was fighting against, he would become himself, all in the pursuit of power and turning his back on what mattered and leaving morals aside. But in the tragic case of Venom Snake, would die like the soldier he is, loyal to his purpose and loyal to Big Boss's will. He sacrificed himself at the very end, even though some would question that he would have been better going down his own path. Some will find it hard to fathom how his loyalty still could remain so true after being betrayed by Big Boss and the likes of Cypher that would be considered both of his enemies. But considering what we've seen, we know this is why Big Boss appointed Venom Snake to be the commander of Outer Heaven. It's most likely that Big Boss knew that Solid Snake would achieve and succeed within the mission, and with the death of his Phantom, would go hand in hand with his plans to fake his death to make his resurgence towards Zanzibar land, giving him all the time he needs to surprise attack and launch a coup d'etat against Cypher. Zero elevated Big Boss, the hero who saved the world, to the status of an idol. The truth behind Big Boss became riddled with exaggeration, misrepresentation, and outright lies. Zero disseminated these stories among the masses and gathered the rich and powerful to his banner. Every era needs its symbols to control the people, whether it be the stars and stripes, or the hammer and sickle. It would be the same story all again in Zanzibar, but worse. The exploitation within Zanzibar and the African people was beyond comprehensible, using scientists to do forced research, and child soldiers as such, trying to escape the very Zanzibar facility. Despite Big Boss's efforts, Metal Gear D was destroyed, and his most trusted lieutenant, Grey Fox was also defeated in hand-to-hand -hand combat by Solid Snake. Big Boss would confront Snake in an underground base, appealing to the warrior within Snake that craved the world of perpetual warfare that he was trying to create. Having spent his entire life on the battlefield, Big Boss could not conceive of a world without war.
Big Boss's descent into madness and delusions of becoming a corrupt government figure stem from that complex interplay of his personal trauma, his disillusionment with authority, and the first for power. Throughout his journey, he experienced profound loss and betrayal, which fractured his sense of morality, and he sowed the seeds of resentments towards established institutions. Big Boss would begin to view himself as above the constraints of conventional morality, believing that his vision of the world free from the outside control justifies any means necessary. Solid Snake mirrors Big Boss's younger self, embodying noble intentions and a desire to make a difference. Like his father, he possesses a strong sense of duty and willingness to sacrifice for the greater good. However, Solid Snake confronts the harsh realities of wars and moral ambiguity of his missions. But unlike his father, he wouldn't be the risk of succumbing to the temptations that ensnared his father. And with the death of the boss, Big Boss's mentor and mother figure deeply impacts both Big Boss and Solid Snake. Her final speech echoing Big Boss's own rhetoric serves as a poignant reminder of the clinical nature of the conflict and perpetuation of the same ideals across generations. It really does underscore the tragic irony of Big Boss's transformation from a soldier fighting for freedom to a figure of oppression, and serves as a warning to Solid Snake of the dangers of losing sight of not only just trying to change the world, but to leave it as it is. And sadly, Big Boss would never truly understand the boss's will, only up until the end of Metal Gear Solid 4, where Big Boss would realize his sins and come to an understanding of his own inner demons that plagued him, and finally truly know what the boss's will really meant. Take this. Keep it safe. While Big Boss may have strayed from the path of righteousness, his ideals continue to inspire his son, Solid Snake, and even Liquid Snake, as well as characters like Solidus Snake, and others throughout the Metal Gear Solid series. Solid Snake in particular carried on his father's quest, driven by a sense of duty and desire to honor his legacy with each mission that he confronted the oppressive forces of the Patriots and would fight to dismantle their control over society. His struggles mirror those of his father, underscoring the cynical nature of their shared mission and the enduring impact of Big Boss's legacy. Similarly to Solidus Snake, the clone of Big Boss would seek his own continuation of his father's work. Jack, it's not power I want. What I wanted to take back from the Patriots are things like freedom, civil rights, opportunities. The founding principles of this country. Everything that's about to be wiped out by their digital censorship. 
that be it though more extreme means, his rebellions against the Patriots represent a direct challenge to their authority and a continuation of Big Boss's vision of a world free from outside control. As the series unfolds, other characters such as Otacon, Bryden, and even some of the AI constructs of the Patriots themselves become allies in the fight against tyranny and oppression. Each in their own way contributes to the ongoing struggle to fulfill Big Boss's vision of a world where individuals are free to determine their own destinies. In this way, while Big Boss may have fallen from grace, his goals live on through their actions of those who seek to finish what he started. Their collective efforts serve as a testament to the enduring power of his ideals and the hope for a future where freedom and autonomy reign supreme. So as we reach the end of this journey, let us bid farewell to a legend, hero, and a tragic figure, Big Boss. Despite the darkness that consumed him, his legacy endures, inspiring generations to fight for freedom and autonomy. As we reflect on his struggles and sacrifices, let us remember that even in our darkest moments, there is always hope. Well guys, this is it for today's video. I hope you've enjoyed this one. And I just want to say thank you to all my subscribers that have supported me. And if you're new here, think about subscribing for more Metal Gear Solid content. Until then, guys, keep fighting for change. There's only room for one boss and one snake. Boss, you only need one snake. No. The world would be better off without snakes.